Gail, I think we're ready. Perfect, thank you. I call these artifacts. We're just waiting for the um, camera to go on, and then we'll be ready to start. Yep. You're going to be on TV soon. No lipstick. Yeah, sorry. I never wear any. It's <laughs> good. Yeah, but they're not on the agenda. Right. Yeah. I was pretty sure they weren't. I wanted you to have it. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. They always work. Yeah, you have to cut it way up in the to cut them way up in the end. Five. This is the I think so. It's the smallest group we've had in the two mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can remember. <coughs> oh, if I leave, you don't have a plan. That's right. You go home. <laughs> I don't feel well. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the Town Council for June 17th. Um, Councillor Spinello, would you please lead us in the pledge? Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councilor Breton is unable to attend. Councilor Forrest may be late. Councilor Hurley? Here. Councilor Latina is unable to attend. Councilor Lesser? Here. Councilor Rell may be late. Councilor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank you. Glad to see we have a quorum to begin our meeting tonight. Um, first thing on the agenda is a proclamation for Richard Lasher. Um, if you, if, would you like to come up or would you like to stay seated while I present it? Okay. You want to come on over here? Come right over here. Would it be easier for you to sit? Huh? Better stand. stand. All right. No, that is bad. Okay. So, whereas Richard B. Lasher, a longtime resident of Wethersfield, has lived in the most eventful period of this country's history, will celebrate his 100th birthday on June 26, 2019. Whereas Mary Jean Pratt on September 12, 1942, and together had three sons, Jared, Jonathan, Joel, and a daughter, Elizabeth, and enjoyed 72 years of marriage. The honorary mayor, I know. <laughs> Whereas founder of the Lasher Supply Company, Inc., in 1954, Richard Lasher served as CEO until his retirement in 1984 and also is the creator of Griswoldville Whimsies. And we have a bunch of them on display up here that we had in the town clerk's office. Um, Richard Lasher is still known as the honorary mayor of Griswoldville, who exhibited a high standard of professionalism with exemplary conduct, setting a standard of excellence for all public servants to emulate. And whereas, he has been an active member of the Griswoldville Chapel Association and volunteered as a fence viewer, where he always showed a sense of fairness, thus furthering the cause of better understanding between neighbors from June 1976 until resigning in 2010. And whereas Richard B. Lasher, 
always led off our Memorial Day parade every year attired in colonial clothing, proudly served as a justice of the peace, and also faithfully attended many town council meetings. And whereas his often humorous antics, along with his exuberant nature, has been able to instill pride and love of town, state, and country to all with whom he has come in contact, and has earned him the respect and affection from people of all walks of life. Now, therefore, on behalf of the town council, I, Amy Morin Bello, mayor of the town of Wethersfield, do hereby congratulate Richard B. Lasher, honorary mayor of Griswoldville, as a centenarian and extend our deep appreciation for his distinguished service as an outstanding citizen of the town of Wethersfield and wish him many more years of health. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the town of Wethersfield to be affixed the 17th day of June, 2019. It's an honor to give you this proclamation. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. You. And I'll hand it over to your son. And did you want to say a few words? To you? <laughs> to anybody here. I want to thank you. It's certainly a pleasure to be in an upright position. <laughs> <laughs> it's not everybody at, at the age that I am is uh, alive and well. And I want to thank you to the town of Wethersfield for taking good care of me for all these years. I went to the school. All my education was here. And I did volunteer work here. It's been a pleasure and an honor to live in Wethersfield, and because it's the oldest town in Connecticut, That's right. I'm the oldest man in Wethersfield. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one more honor for you. Come on up. I'm Tom Baldwin, chairman of the Grizzleville Chapel, and um, I first of all want to thank the council members for giving us a few member, uh, minutes to to thank Dick and honor him for what he did for us. Mm -hmm. Dick was a longtime member of the chapel. He was on every committee that we had. And not surprisingly, he also uh, enlightened our lives with his, his fun and uh, good humor. And uh, the words on this certificate um, don't really begin to convey the sense of, a, of gratitude, Dick, that we have toward you. But perhaps when you see this on your wall, you'll remember that uh, the chapel members uh, will never forget you. And this certificate of appreciation, it says, to Richard Lasher, on the occasion of your 100th birthday, the Grizzleville Chapel wishes to honor and thank you for your many years of service, for acting as our unofficial ambassador, injecting humor into our proceedings, working tirelessly on our behalf, and helping us in ways large and small. Thank you, Dick, for everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. <laughs> and next we have a proclamation for the Alzheimer's um, and Brain Awareness Month. If I can have members of that group come on up. Okay. Why don't you come stand over here? That way you're on TV. Yeah. We'll get you on TV. She has a big one. Okay. Perfect. So, whereas 78,000 people in Connecticut are living with Alzheimer's disease, and there are 178,000 caregivers in this state, 
And whereas Alzheimer's disease is a progressive degenerative disease of the brain and the most common form of dementia, which results in impaired memory, thinking, and behavior, and usually begins gradually, causing a person to forget recent events and have difficulty performing familiar tasks. And whereas the disease causes confusion, personality, and behavioral changes, and eventually the person loses the ability to care for themselves, which take a huge physical, emotional, and financial toll on caregivers. Whereas Alzheimer's is fatal and kills more people than breast and prostate cancer combined. And whereas the Alzheimer's Association asks all people to come together this June to support Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month and join the fight to end Alzheimer's. And whereas you can visit alz.org to learn more about Alzheimer's and other dementias, the warning signs, importance of early detection and diagnosis, as well as information on care, support, and research to find a new treatment or cure now. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Town Council, I, Amy Mornbello, Mayor of the Town of Wethersfield, do hereby proclaim June 2019 as Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month in the state of Connecticut in support of increasing public awareness of Alzheimer's disease. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the Town of Wethersfield to be affixed this 17th day of June, 2019. Robin, I'll hand that to you. You're welcome. And do you have a few words you'd like to share before we cut the ribbon? I have to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mayor. I'm so um, grateful that Wethersfield's joining us in our, our uh, quest to turn the state purple for June. Um, on behalf of the 78,000 people that have Alzheimer's disease and the 178,000 unpaid caregivers that are taking care of them and the toll that that takes both financially and emotionally on their families, we thank you. Um, and we're told that mayors like to cut ribbons, so we brought a ribbon. And I'll just, I'll just mention that um, when the mayor of Danbury gave me his proclamation, he said it um, allowed me to drive as fast as I want in the town. <laughs> <laughs> but really, thank you. <laughs> but thank you so much. Okay, so our next um, item of business is a presentation with the Capital Region Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. Good evening. Hi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Noah Sloven. Um, I'm from a company called Mylona McBroom. Uh, we've been working on updating the, um, the, the region's hazard mitigation plan. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a little presentation about what we've done. Um, and Before you begin, I'll just ask yeah. if you talk into the microphone because Probably that not. one does not pick up really all that well. Is this better? Oh, yeah. much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's more for um, getting it out to our TV audience right. even than those in the room. So we have a big TV you. audience, so they're watching. <laughs> <laughs> all right. For the viewers at home. Um, let me know when that's up. My chair's falling down. Okay. My chair started to fall down. What was that? Well, uh, so while that's while that's starting up, I'll just uh, say what I'm going to present to you in a in a moment. Um, so I'm just going to summarize a little bit of of what the hazard mitigation plan is, in, in a very general sense, what that means, uh, why it's important for Weathersfield to have one, um, review a little bit of what's included in the plan itself uh, in terms of what hazards we look at and what types of hazard mitigation actions we're, we cover, and then um, I'll go through some of the actual mitigation actions that we have in the plan. Uh, there are 25 for Weathersfield, so I'm not going to walk through all of them. Um, but I'll give it a little summary of, what, of what's in there and then open it up to questions. Okay. All right, so uh, the, the hazard mitigation plan, um, the, the authority for these plans is through the Disaster Mitigation Act of 2000. Um, thank you. 
The goal is to promote disaster preparedness as well as uh, hazard mitigation actions to reduce losses. I'll explain a little bit more about the difference between those soon. Um, and importantly, there are three different grant programs that come out through FEMA, um, through the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Grants. Uh, that's the PDM, the FMA, and the HMGP. Uh, these three different grants can uh, provide funding to municipalities to implement hazard mitigation projects. And I'll define all of these things in more detail. So what is a natural hazard? It's an extreme natural event that poses a risk to people, infrastructure, and resources. Examples include flooding, high wind events, wildfire. Uh, it does not include human-caused uh, disasters um, or directly human-caused disasters. And hazard mitigation are actions that you take to uh, reduce the risk of hazards on the long term. So as opposed to hazard emergency response or immediate, immediate actions to address a hazard, these are things that you do when the weather is nice out so that once there is a storm, the disaster is not as bad. Uh, the local communities that have FEMA mitigation plans, uh, it, it FEMA, what's the word? FEMA approved hazard mitigation plans. They're eligible for those grants, um, and communities that don't are not eligible for those grants. So that's uh, another benefit of having this plan, in addition to the general guidance it gives to how you want to move forward as a as a community. Um, the different types of projects that are included. There's many of them, but uh, on the Right over here, you can see the top five from the last year. Um, acquisitions of properties that are in hazard zones. Uh, somebody owns a house that's at risk uh, and wants to sell it, but it can be difficult to sell because it's in a risk zone. So there's funding to buy those properties from those owners. Um, flood control structures, elevating buildings, protecting utility and infrastructures, uh, safe rooms and wind shelters, which uh, I haven't seen any of that done in Connecticut. but. Um, other examples, culvert replacements, drainage projects, stabilizing banks, uh, and then retrofitting uh, critical facilities to protect them from disasters. So in this plan, the disasters that we cover are floods, hurricanes and tropical storms, tornadoes and high winds, winter storms, drought, fires, dam failure, and earthquakes. Um, and we do look at the effects that climate change is projected to have on all of the relevant uh, disasters. So uh, I'm going to cover a little bit of what types of mitigation strategies we look at. Uh, they fall into six categories, prevention, natural resource protection, structural projects, property protection, emergency, emergency services, um, and then public education, which can apply to all of those. Um, and what I'm the next few slides are some examples of how these have been successfully applied in the region uh, from the previous plan. So these have all been funded by FEMA uh, grants. So property acquisitions in Plainville, uh, the Hartford Boathouse uh, waterproofing that was or floodproofing that was a FEMA funded project, improving drainage systems. Uh, revisiting regulations and implementing these low-impact development zoning regulations uh, in, in different towns in the region. Uh, fuel cells and microgrids, and actually, uh, I believe in Weathersfield, there were um, uh, backup generators in critical facilities that were funded with FEMA grants since the previous plan. Uh, South Windsor Emergency Operations Center, that critical facility, they redid the roof to make it withstand hurricane storms, hurricane winds, and uh, education, public education on websites, things like that. So there's all sorts of uh, different types of actions that we can choose from, um, and through uh, meeting with the, with the town and um, reviewing past actions and other things at a regional level, we came up with a suite of actions to include in this plan. Uh, there are 25. Um, some of them have to do with uh, helping public works, uh, improving the capabilities of public works to recover and clean up after a disaster, uh, repairing catch basins and drainage. Uh, there are a number that deal with uh, dam upgrades and maintenance, um, reaching out to local small businesses, and, and also uh, EMI courses and seminar, seminars. Those are emergency response seminars for municipal staff, 
Um, a few more. Um, other, other drainage improvements, dam improvements, I think everything on these, these are all those, those types of actions. Um, and, and snow related actions, identifying space for, to, to place snow if there's a large storm. Um, talking to repetitive loss property owners about how to protect their properties and uh, becoming certified with uh, the Sustainable Connecticut program and looking at historic resources and protecting them. Historic resources can be particularly difficult to protect from disasters uh, because of limits on how you can change them while maintaining their status. So that, that's also in here as an action. Um, so yeah, so the, the next steps to this process uh, is to sign, have, have the council sign the resolution. Uh, we give that back to the region and the region then is compiling the signed resolutions from all member communities that will go back to FEMA and then you'll have an official uh, an official FEMA hazard mitigation plan and you can then use that to uh, seek hazard mitigation funds from Demis and FEMA from the state and the federal government. Um, so that's all I have. I do have like other summaries of the um, of the hazard mitigation actions if, if people want other perspectives on those, but I can also answer any questions. Sure, why don't we see if any council members have any questions. Council Hurley? There was some numbers in the, what we received, on, and it said 75,000 of earthquake. I don't know how we uh, oh, lost. Know we had any earthquakes in Weathersfield and yeah, so part of, part of what FEMA requires in the hazard mitigation plan are loss estimates. Um, and we, we calculate them. There's a, uh, various different ways of calculating and presenting them. Um, for earthquakes, it's a FEMA, a FEMA software, a FEMA modeling software. So these are estimates. This isn't something. These are happens. estimates, okay. yeah. Um, so some of them are based on, on past events. Um, I don't know if you, if you have the plan in front of you, um, you could. Well, I, I won't go find the specific okay. page. So these but are just estimates that you say we They're, might they're have just estimates. The, okay. the idea of the loss estimates is not uh, so much kind of fear tactics of here is the worst case scenario, but more to get a, a range of what's reasonable to spend over time to mitigate that disaster. So okay. a, a specific earthquake event could potentially cause a lot of damage based on that, that software. But if you divide that by the number of years between when you'd expect an event of that size, you come up with a number, uh, which I, I don't know off the top of my head, but in the thousands of dollars range, that if you wanted to spend that much money on an action to protect critical facilities from, from earthquakes, you could show those numbers to FEMA and that justifies you spending that much money on that project because of the loss estimate, if that makes sense. Okay, yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Deputy Mayor? Uh, just a comment from reading through it uh, on page 35-1 of the plan yes. where you list the different facilities and generators. Yes. Uh, I, I know for sure there's a generator at the Nature Center. Okay. So that needs to be added back in. And on Public Works, I'm guessing fuel station underneath of it, does that coincide with Public Works if it's separate? I would think, and Derek could cl clarify it better than me, but I think the generator at Public Works would also handle the fueling station down there. That's a good so point. those should both be checked with generators. I can't speak for the correct school. Okay, yeah, I can make those two changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you for the presentation. Okay. We appreciate Thanks. your time and coming out here tonight. You're welcome, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, we move into public comment as soon as the screens come up. Um, we have no uh, hearings this evening, so we'll move into general public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. If you would please give us your name and address before you begin and speak into the microphone. Mr. Mazzarella. <laughs> you look like you're... <laughs> Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. So I was reading that mitigation plan report. It was quite interesting. 
There's a lot of information in there. I'm wondering how many people actually have read this whole thing. Um, they come up with the, the conclusion, basically, towards the end of the report. They list 25 action items. The town proposed to initiate several new mitigation actions for the upcoming five years. Additionally, a number of actions from the previous plan period are being carried forward or re replaced with revised actions. They are listed below. Each of the following actions has been prioritized based on FEMA guidelines listed from highest to lowest priority. So up at the top of the list, number two, identify strategies for making replacement or enlargement of a sand salt storage facility more achievable. It says track damages to sand salt, salt, salt storage facility so that a benefit cost analysis can be completed. Number three on the action list Develop a long-range plan for expansion of public works building capacity and relocation outside of a floodplain. So as you all are aware, our physical services facility is in a, is in a floodplain. I'm questioning why we're spending $600,000 to put a replacement salt shed with larger capacity Item number two on the action list, back in the floodplain, when item three wants you to move it out of the floodplain. It doesn't make any sense. I know it's, it's beside the point now. It's being constructed as we speak, I believe. But do we really sit down and read all this stuff before we act on it? I mean, it makes no logical sense to be putting this salt storage facility in a known problem area. Um, and I know there was some grandfathered clause issues, which to me is not a good reason to rush the project through because if we do it now, it's grandfathered in, even though it's still in a bad place, rather than wait a year when they won't grandfather it. I really think we should do a better job of reading these reports and figuring out where we want to go. Uh, this was prepared, I believe, and started in 2014, updated in 17. But the fact remains, it's been a reoccurring item on these long-range plans to move this facility to a better place. So now we're going to have a new $600,000 salt storage shed and a $200,000 lift in a facility that we're going to maybe 10 years down the road move to maybe Highland Street or some other property the town has. <laughs> <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to just make a quick comment about is ton on tonight's agenda you're going to cancel a couple town meetings which is understandable, it's summertime and there's gonna be a lot of people absent. But I was reading through the town council rules and procedures and I was a little bit disturbed that the last meeting was canceled. And I'm not sure if that was proper or not. What I'm reading here is that they're scheduled on uh, first and third Mondays, whether it be a regular meeting or a workshop meeting and it says, unless otherwise determined by the council, which I believe you're gonna to do tonight, you're gonna to have a vote by the council to cancel two meetings. I don't believe you had a vote two weeks ago to cancel the prior meeting. And is that proper? It goes on to say that if a meeting is adjourned to a date, a time, and a place certain, a notice shall be conspicuously posted, which I'm sure was done. But I don't think that's proper to cancel the meeting. I think the town meetings are important. Now granted, we don't have a lot of attendees, but the meeting form of government, it's, our, it's the public's opportunity 
to convey whatever they have on their mind to the town elected officials. And you've canceled that without, in my opinion, good reason. I believe the notice said that there was no agenda items. Well, public comments an agenda item. And the public has a right to speak. Uh, there may be something important. Maybe an individual that wants a stop sign put up. Maybe somebody that wants to make the town aware of properties that are being sold at a reduced price. And, and, and a number of other things. Uh, I think you should consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. Um, I didn't read the, mitigate, the hazard mitigation thoroughly, but I did browse through it on, online. And uh, the salt shed did stick out, very much so. You know, we're going to build a new shed. And, 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 and we all knew that was a zone that was prone to problems someday. And of course, now if your litigation, uh, mitigation plan is to move that whole area, you might want to, I think for the sake of spending money to remove, you should consider holding off doing that salt shed. I too, at the last meeting that was canceled, wanted to come down and talk, like I always do. It's a good social for me. And I was disappointed that the meeting was canceled. And uh, I, I don't think it should have been canceled, and it shouldn't have been canceled the way it was. Like that. There's process. And canceling two more meetings during the summer, I think, is wrong. Last summer, you, you had all kinds of meetings. Matter of fact, that's when you snuck in your uh, public hearing for the uh, Keisha farm, if you recall correctly. Maybe you don't have a Keisha farm this year to sneak in, so you don't need to have a summer meetings when people are on vacation. But um, it's a concern. I did mention the Keisha farm. And I did send to you folks a couple weeks ago um, a property that had sold in Rocky Hill. You're all aware of that, I'm sure. The public's not, with the exception of those who I sent emails to, with the same thing that you got. But that property was on New Britain Avenue in uh, Rocky Hill, 27 and a half acres of land with a very nice home for $820,000. That's what it sold for. Now, that's $29,721 per acre. And it's only three to four miles away from the Keisha farm, the farm that you're going to pay $75,000 an acre. And if I remember correctly, in reading that, 20, that property on Rocky, in Rocky Hill, there was no wetlands. Keisha farm has four or five acres of wetlands that you're going to also pay $75,000 an acre, which is a disgrace. It's absolutely absurd to pay that kind of money anywhere near that kind of money. It's only worth a few thousand dollars an acre. But for anybody to step up and buy anything like that is out of their minds. And I would urge you to reconsider turning down that offer or turning down that sale because you've had so many so many delays, and you've had an opportunity before to do that, and you knew prices were not anywhere near what you're buying this for. Now, in the meantime, there's more properties coming on the market. Not many of them are selling out of that whole big list that I've been reading to you over time. But tonight, I'm going to just whack off on a couple that are in the same size of the um, Keisha farm. You know, in the town of, of uh, Cheshire, on Weiss Road, there's 36 acres of land, farmland, wide open farmland and some woods. Sounds like Keisha Farm. 
36 acres for $1.8 million. That's $51,000 an acre, roughly. I don't know how you come up with 70, how your appraiser came up with $75,000. There's another one on uh, Ball Fall Road in Middletown, 24 acres. It's for sale for $650,000. That's only $27,000 an acre. Southington had something on Spring Street, 63 acres for $2 million. That's $31,000 an acre. I don't know how in the world you people could have negotiated such a price, $75,000, which also includes four to five acres of wetlands. I don't know how in the world you, you could, in good faith, negotiate anywhere near that price. I mean, your appraiser must have been so far off the, so far off the, the, end, of the uh, end of the planet to come up with a $75,000 price tag per acre for that property. If you would just uh, finish and, up, please. Yes, ma'am. And um, there was another one over in uh, Tallinn, just even though it's far away, it's 83 acres for $1.5 million. That's only $18,000 an acre. This whole region of good land doesn't sell for very much. And what I've done was I've, I've taken the, those that did sell and I've recited those to you in the last meetings. Um, there was about eight of them now. And, and they're only averaging $26,000 an acre. And we're looking at 200 and, 250 acres of land that's sold. And it's only averaging 26,000. I don't know how you came up with, how your appraiser came up with uh, $75,000 an acre, but I think you have a serious problem with your appraiser. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Mr. Colantonio? Good evening. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I was not going to say anything until uh, Mr. Mazzarella mentioned my stop sign. Last week I was talking with a young man living on my street, 12 years old, and he was telling me that he was in the vicinity of Tifton and Morrison Avenue on a bicycle. This is without really knowing anything at all. I play, I run the yard, and he came by, I talked to people, and, and he said, this is 12 years old guy. I says, you know what? I almost got hit, he said. Wow. He says, from where? He says, a car was going so fast. People go too fast in this car, you know. I says, and at Tifton Road and Morrison Avenue, you cannot see much. Now, God forbid something happens. I'm going to come after you guys. Not myself. The law. Because it's amazing. It's 10 years. 10 years now that I've been complaining. And yet, nothing gets done. The only answers I got so far, and please, if I'm wrong, give me another answer, is that too many freaking stop signs are in Wethersfield. That's why I'm not going to give one. Now, the question that I have with the railroad, each intersection got two more stop signs. Did they remove it, stop signs in Wethersfield, to keep the balance, or they just got stop signs? Now, keep in mind, I said it before, and I'm going to say it again. The town engineer is right here. Before 1955, or the original intent of Morrison Avenue was never meant to connect to Silas Dean. Matter of fact, it connected to Silas Dean in 1955. Why? I don't know. There was no right of way at all from Tifton to Silas Dean. There was a right of way, and there is still an existing right of way from Tifton to Church. Why was it done? And I don't mind that at all, that that was open and whatnot. But what bothers me is that, you know, when you compare Hillcrest with Morrison, it's amazing. You guys don't do anything at all after 10 years. And I'm not going to go away. And, and, and a lot of the people in, maybe the town engineer doesn't even know. Because whenever I go and play dumb and ask questions, nobody really knows. Again, the right of way for Hill, Hillcrest is 80 feet. 
The right of way for Morrison Avenue is 50. The setback on Morrison Avenue is only about 20, 25 feet frontage setback. Hillcrest Avenue is about 40. And yet, when you go on Hillcrest Avenue, you have two stop signs, which you don't need it. And you do not have a stop sign on Morrison Avenue because of Tifton, where you need it. For the town engineer, he's right here. The intersection of site distance for Tifton along Morrison Avenue is uh, 232 feet. That's only good for about 24 miles per hour. The 85th percentile goes 31 miles per hour. And the posted speed is 25. That means that there is something wrong. You're telling the people that they can go to 25 miles per hour, but yet it doesn't meet the requirements. I said that before, and I'm going to say it again. Why? How, how do you feel? Politicians, they are like, you know, local, state, everything is all the same. You don't listen because you all have a different agenda. Last year, I got... Uh, Mr. Lesser, I guess, and, and, uh, and Mr. Ralph, they came, and they made me feel good. I really felt, says, oh, wow, something is going to get done. They really agree with me. they telling me, says, yeah, there is a problem right here. They go too fast, and you cannot see very much. Months have gone by. Nothing at all. What is it going to take? Somebody's going to get hurt? Every once in a while, you hear about that, you know, people get, get hit, pedestrians. Is that what we want on Morrison Avenue? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's over 10 years. And, and keep in mind that before the reconstruction of the sidewalk, there was no problem at the intersection of Tifton and Morrison. Because they moved that road, because they, they create the atrocity, it's, it's like you know, an abortion that they've done between Orchard and Tifton. The, nothing aligns. Every year you got to replace the, the curbing, and you have to ask yourself why. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak this evening? Seeing nobody, we will close the public comment. We'll move into council reports. Any council members have reports this evening? Councilor Lesser? Thank you, Mayor. I have two reports from last week. First, the Veterans Committee met on Wednesday, June 10th, and we talked about the June 6th D-Day celebration. Thank you to the Deputy Mayor for participating. Everyone who was able to attend was a great event, and we were happy to partner with the schools. And then we talked about um, next steps for the Veterans Committee, and we do have a website up now that's uh, Veterans Committee. There's a link on the town site, so veterans can go there uh, for information and the services that are provided. And we're hoping to hold some coffees in the fall to hear from veterans and what their concerns are. I also attended uh, the same night, last Wednesday, uh, June 10th, the Human Rights Commission, and we had a great presentation from Deb Cohen. Thank you on her recent trip to the border, uh, and it was a very good meeting of the Human Rights Commission. That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other reports? <laughs> Councilor Rell. Just to follow up with uh, uh, Councilman Lesser, after his Veterans Committee meeting, there was a Memorial Day Parade Committee meeting where there's a little bit of a carryover of the, uh, the members. And uh, I can tell you that this year's uh, Memorial Day Parade was one of the best parades that I've uh, ever attended, and I've been going to parades for about 15 years in Old Weathersfield. The weather was perfect. The day was perfect. Uh, our keynote speaker, as well as our honorees, the Gold Star and Blue Star families, um, it was just a tremendous uh, a ceremony for them. Uh, I will tell you, looking at some of the uh, uh, families uh, of the fallen uh, soldiers that we had honored, um, they were, uh, you know, taken with emotion uh, by Mr. Granado's uh, uh, keynote address. Uh, it was one of the best that I had heard. Uh, as well, we had received a, um, a letter of appreciation from the uh, Connecticut chapter of the Gold Star Families. And in that letter, they, they did compliment the entire town, uh, both the Parks and Rec as well as the committee uh, for outstanding work. Uh, they had marched in a number of parades, and this was one of the best that they had marched in themselves as well. So great job by uh, not only by the town, but by town staff and, uh, and the committee as a whole. Uh, great job. Thanks. 
Thank you. <clears throat> um, do we have council comments? Deputy Mayor? Uh, just a couple things uh, regarding the uh, uh, D-Day celebration last week. I want to compliment Mr. Lesser and the Veterans Committee on the great job they did. Uh, but I especially want to send Caduce out to uh, both uh, social studies teacher John Sand and uh, French teacher Ann Katrinkas, uh, the two teachers who put this program together. They did a super job. Um, as Ken said, uh, I was one of the speakers in one of the classrooms. The kids were very attentive, asked a lot of good questions afterwards, and I think it was a very well put together presentation. Uh, after that, we went down to the auditorium and things were over. The kids were dismissed back to their class but had an opportunity to come up to see the veterans. And I might be wrong, Kenny can correct me, but I'd say at least 60% of the kids in that auditorium came up to shake hands and thank every veteran's hands for their service. So uh, I think that kind of commends that the respect our students have for uh, our military people and our military history. So I just want to say special kudos to Mr. Sand and Ms. Uh, Trinkus. Also, uh, after, uh, at the beginning of the month, on behalf of the mayor, I went to the uh, Buds and Blossoms uh, Garden Group is uh, ceasing activities after many, many years. And uh, I went and presented them with a proclamation Two of their charter members was, were, were there, both in their early 90s, and were very well impressed and thanked them for the great job they've done over a year keeping our town beautiful. And uh, just also want to say last week, uh, the chamber had a business after hours right across the street at the office park that was put on by all the uh, businesses in that era. Uh, Councilor Hurley and I both attended, and uh, they did a very nice job. And, a lot of chamber people got together in businesses and communicated back and forth to help each other's businesses grow in town. Thank you. Any other council comments? Councilor Lesser. Thank you, Mayor. Just want to let everybody know that on Friday, um, June 7th, we had the fourth annual Weathersfield Mayor's Charity Ball. Uh, and we raised uh, $29,000, which now brings our total to 100000 in four years. All that money is donated right here in Weathersfield to social, youth and social services and to a senior food program. And I just want to thank um, the town for its great support of that event. And it's nice to be able to give that check, which will be on Thursday, a check ceremony here at 4 o'clock to present um, that check for the money raised. So thank you for everyone's support. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, um, I'd like to make a few announcements. Town Hall summer hours begin this week. So Town Hall will be open until 6 p.m. on Thursday, closing 1 o'clock on Friday. Um, the train is up and running. Um, I heard it actually this afternoon from my house. Um, ha have we received any complaints or had any problems yet? Time. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, I'd also like to remind people that there's a community conversation coming up on June 20th. There are flyers over on the table here. It's, the information is also available on our town website. Um, and the town manager, I think, will discuss it a little further in a minute. Uh, we do ask that if you're interested in attending the community conversation, that you RSVP. There is a phone number and an email address, uh, both on the flyer and on our website. Um, I will be having mayor's office hours on Thursday, June 27th, July 25th, and August 26th. 22nd from 5 to 6 here in Town Hall in the Town Manager's Conference Room. That's an opportunity for anybody who wants to meet with me and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion. I'll be available then. Um, we had a lot going on in the last few weeks. I'd like to thank uh, the committees and volunteers in our town and Board of Ed staff for all their hard work at the Memorial Day Parade, the fireworks, um, the D-Day ceremony at Weathersfield High School, the Mayor's Charity Ball, the Bicycle Festival we had, and um, as well as graduation. A lot of great community events. We got the opportunity to see a lot of 
um, our residents enjoying our town and being part of something within our community. So I was happy to see to be part of all of those events. Uh, last, the town manager and I attended the Hartford Foundation's Greater Together Community uh, Meeting. The Hartford Foundation is giving $100,000 to each of its 29 communities. 50,000 is in an endowed fund. 50,000 is immediate use fund. Um, the purpose is to support the community in taking ownership around the needs in their town, encouraging broad and inclusive civic engagement, and to anchor the Hartford Foundation in each town. So in the coming months, we will be looking for residents, um, not elected officials, but residents of the community to form a group that will then decide the purpose of these funds. Um, and one of the caveats from the Hartford Foundation is this group must be inclusive. So we're asking now for people who are not usually involved in town government and who not, maybe not usually come to our meetings and take part um, to perhaps be involved in this uh, committee and to work with town staff to determine the use of the $50,000 of immediate use funds. So that is all I have. And I'll turn it over to the town manager. Thank you, Mayor, and to the honorable council members as well. Um, I'll just touch briefly upon a few things, uh, reiterating what the mayor said. The first is uh, for the Hartford Foundation funds, uh, they really are trying to reach out to uh, a, a group of individuals who aren't normally necessarily involved. Um, and if you want to come forward, they can reach out. I'll, I guess I don't count because I'm not an elected official, uh, but as a resident and the town manager, I can participate to some level. So uh, for those of you out there in the community listening, uh, they can reach out to my office and we'll start to collect information related to them. Um, the train was mentioned by the mayor. If you haven't heard it by now, um, it will probably, they'll be increasing the amount of uh, trips through town, I believe they were trying to just keep it to Monday, Wednesday, Friday for the first two weeks. Now it looks like it'll probably be every day, uh, one trip, at least one trip up, one trip back. At this point, I don't believe there's any uh, been any significant issues. There are some sightline concerns that are being addressed through engineering and um, with the Department of Transportation. Um, there are currently temporary signs in place as well as the permanent stop signs to just reinforce to drivers who may have been conditioned to drive over the tracks over and over again. I know I'm guilty myself um, of not necessarily, or forgetting that there were train tracks there because you're just used to not having them there. We are gonna keep those temporary signs in place for a period of time, um, at least another 30 days, and then we'll start to pull the permanent ones away as we start to see that there's been a change in behavior. Uh, we continue to monitor sites on a regular basis, and this is for safety purposes. Um, the state budget has moved uh, forward slightly. It has not fully been signed, at least I don't think it has been in the last 48 hours. It hasn't been executed. Um, I had asked through, uh, the mayor had asked me through uh, Finance Director Michael O'Neill to see if I could get an update as to what the impact may be to the town budget. Uh, I have included in my package to the council a copy of that memo, but for those out in the audience and listening on the TV and watching on the TV, I'll just summarize it. Um, that the General Assembly adopted the budget. It's around $429.9 million or 2.1% of an increase over last year's budget, which uh, last year's budget, which was a total of 21.3 billion. This increased the total statewide municipal aid by $59.4 million or a 1.9% increase to municipalities, which will affect both educational and non-educational um, resources in the state. Withersfield fared very, uh, fairly well in the approved budget. Most of the line items that the governor proposed were approved. Um, some changes include the education cost sharing or ECS. Those are state funds that are granted to a as aid to the town that increased by approximately $639,000 or 6.6% increase. Those funds uh, are attributed to the Board of Education. And we did have a slight reduction in the local capital improvement program, also known as LOSIP, which reduced, uh, last year we were around 213,000 this year. We're gonna receive, this year and next year, we're slated to receive $183,000. Uh, 
um, and speaking to the town engineer, that will be a negligible impact. Um, LOSIP is a project-based program for us. We submit to the state. The state uh, we submit a project to the state. The state reimburses us for those costs. Um, in this particular case, a thirty thousand dollar cut is. Uh, will just be carried over if if we can't achieve it with that loss, it'll be carried over to next year's loss of funds. Uh, the mayor mentioned the community conversations that the first of which will be held on June twentieth. This will be, and I can't stress it enough, this is the first on a series of conversations that we want to have with the community. This first event, it was decided that we needed to focus on trauma and the effect of trauma on. Uh, residents individually and as a community as a whole and um, we all react differently to trauma uh, and traumatic events some people in internalize it other individuals show it uh, through anger uh, people become vocal people become depressed uh, there's a phenomenon dealing with vicarious trauma which is that effect where you say well this could have happened to me it, it, it could have been something directly happened to me even though you may not have been directly affected by it. Those are all real things that happen, and we have to approach this as if um, from a different level of understanding. So what we've experienced is friends, neighbors, neighbors within the surrounding community. Um, we've created a sharp divide amongst each other. We need to figure out how to heal, how to bring people back to the table, um, and talk a little bit about how we as individuals and as a community move forward from this event. So I'm calling this first conversation our building block. There are some flyers on the side uh, that we can hand out, but this I'm, I'm considering this the building block for future discussions about our community. It asks us to step back, keep our minds open, and listen to each other so that we can understand which where each, each side is coming from. So that's an important part of healing, and I think it's important for us to look to connect and reconnect with our neighbors and friends and families. So uh, great event scheduled for Thursday. Um, June 20th, starting at 6 p.m., doors open at 5.30 p.m. For anyone interested in attending, the RSVP is to uh, conversations at weathersfieldct.gov or the phone number is 860-721-2977. And I think that was... There will be child care and refreshments available. Yep. <clears throat> okay. That was it. All right. And the town clerk, do you have any communications this evening? Uh, yes, I have that. We have uh, so far done 769 dogs to have them licensed. The state registers dogs to be sure that all dogs have current rabies shots. That's $8 for an uh, altered dog, and uh, it is unaltered dogs are $19. We had a received information from Governor Lamont this that his appointments to Weathersfield are Andrew Adel to the MDC, and Michael Osmond uh, has been appointed to the Harbor Master, and Derek Vizenzo is Deputy Harbor Master for the Cove. Okay, thank you. Moving into council action, uh, I don't believe we have any acceptances of resignations or I don't believe we have any appointments or ordinances or resolutions for action. Um, we have no matters of unfinished business this evening, so we will move into other business. Uh, council summer meeting schedule. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to eliminate the meetings of July 1st, 2019 and August 5th, 2019. And do I have a second? Second. Okay. Are there any questions or concerns about this motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, next order of business is the Capital Region Natural Hazard Mitigation Plan. Do I have a motion? Yes, thank you, Mayor. I move to authorize the Town Manager, Gary A. Evans, to sign and Town Clerk, Dolores G. Cesano, to sign and seal this document as part of the plan approval process. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Mr. Town Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the five-year update to the previous plan, which was adopted in 2014. Once adopted, it will be the official plan for the Town of Wethersfield as it relates to any hazard mitigation projects for the next five years. 
This document is required, as we heard during the presentation, by FEMA um, and is necessary to access any federal funds to address future hazards and action items uh, enumerated within the plan. Are there any council comments or questions? Council Hurley? I didn't have a question. I just kind of agree with a few remarks people made about one of our highest priorities is moving our town uh, works, public works, and then we put a brand new salt shed down there. I mean, if we know we're never going to move it, why have it as, as one of the top things on our priority? Because unless there is somewhere where we're going to move it, I've never heard anybody talk about that. So either that or let's take it off the, let's get it off of there. Yeah, and I think it, it, I think probably it's long range was listed and. It's one of the top ones though. It's not like it's down the bottom. Yeah, but, and so I wasn't here for the, uh, the participation that took place, but typically with regional plans, we're not necessarily the driving force in that. So there's an analysis done as part of the consultant, uh, the gentleman from Milo and McBroom left, but usually the consultant will go through and rank it based off of areas of concern, and that probably rose to the top as part of the regional um, analysis of, well, you know, you have a major facility located within a floodplain, and that creates the largest hazard in terms of uh, um, replacement costs and, and funding. Um, you know, in terms of a FEMA project, they would say, okay, well, there's a reasonable dollar amount associated with if we had a loss, that would be a, a large loss. But that is something I would absolutely know as part of the next plan that came through and a conversation would have to take place on um, how we address that. Thank you. Deputy Mayor? Uh, just a comment. Uh, it's great to look ahead to the future and what the needs are, but what are our immediate needs? And if you had gone down and seen the current salt shed that was there, it was a definite safety hazard ready to collapse and something had to be done. It wasn't just the fact that we were trying to beat the, uh, a grandfather clause. It's something for the safety of our employees we had to do and we got the money together to do it. So uh, there was no other place to build it. So you know we had to do what we had to do for the safety of our employees. Councilor Hurley. That was a very expensive project for a salt shed. That's all I have to say. Any other comments or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, we move into bids. Our first bid is for a custodial contract for Town Hall, Police Department, Physical Services, Garage, and the Library. Do I have a motion? Make a motion to award a one-year extension to SMG Corporate Services in Shelton, Connecticut, in the amount of $91,615,092 to provide custodial services at Town Hall Police. Wait, did you say $91 million? Did I? I think so. Oh, $91,000. $91, okay, I'm okay I, with that. Corrected. <laughs> Uh, at custodial services at Town Hall, Police Department, Physical Service Garage, and the library. Okay, thank you. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Town Manager? Certainly. Uh, this is a no increase in cost contract extension for services that are currently being provided. The recommendation is to extend this contract only for one year. Okay, do we have Council, Council Rell? Uh, just a couple questions uh, on this contract. This is a uh, contract for the police department, library, town hall, phys and physical services. Um, is it five days a week that they they do this work? It's five days a week in every building. It might be seven in the police department. I have to go back and look. It might be seven in police and library. Do we know, is it eight hour shift, four hour shift? It rotates again I'd, I'd have to look um, within town hall it's a four-hour shift I don't know about the other buildings okay and then uh, final question would be is this a private contract or is this a um, a union contract 
This is non-union. Non-union. This is private. Yep. Contract. Okay. Just and then those were my questions. Just a comment on the uh, what I had just uh, mentioned. Looking at the agreed contract for the eighteen nineteen. Uh, yeah, I guess it was the eighteen nineteen agreed upon contract for the Board of Ed custodians. Uh, the average, and I just did it real quick, average salary of the custodians for the Board of Ed, and I know it's different because it's not, shift change is different. They probably are five days a week, eight hour days. But the average salary for those folks was 47227 times two is $94,454. Uh, this is a pretty good deal with no increase at five days a week, let's just say 50 weeks a year, maybe not 52, uh, at $91,615. Um, this is a, a really good deal by this company for not um, raising their rates, just comparable between the Board of Ed custodians and a private entity. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. And we have another bid, uh, town road and parking lot, pavement marking. Do I have a motion? Yes, Mayor. I move to award a contract to Atlantic Paving Marketings, Inc., Prospect, Connecticut, in the amount of 41000 to provide pavement marking services along town roads and town parking lots. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Good evening, Derek. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I'm here for uh, <clears throat> requesting award of our annual paving program. Um, these, this program is funded through my operating budget and engineering. Um, we do this annually to go and restripe the roads. You may remember last year we had some conversations about reducing the, uh, the scope of the work to paint uh, our town parking lots every other year, half one year and half the next. Um, so we implemented that last year. Uh, last year, we did uh, paint our school lots for the most part, except for the high school, because uh, that didn't require it yet. They had used an epoxy resin paint there that lasts longer. Um, so we had done our school lots with the intent of crack sealing our town lots, which has just gotten completed uh, in the last few weeks. The plan for this coming fiscal year is to uh, do the opposite. We're going to paint our town lots and crack seal our school lots. So. We are following the plan of trying to do the lots every other year, although in the roads, um, you know, we are still going back and painting every year. We've been working off of the Krog bid for many years. This particular company has done work in town for quite a few years. They're a little bitter for the paint that we use as hot applied paint. Um, and I'm recommending a word of the contract to them uh, so we can schedule the work for the summer. So how did the, um, <clears throat> how did the change of the program um, pan out? Any problems with you know, um, painting lines every other year? No, I think, you know, if you look at the park a lot out here, I mean, it's parking lot, so I think we can get away, in my opinion, we can get away with doing that if that's the preference um, because they don't get as much traction or as much um, wear and tear as you get out on the roads. Um, plus, there are less safety markings like crosswalks and things of that nature that you would get on the roads you don't have in the parking lot. So I think looking at it, I think that's something we can just consider doing going forward, and um, that should work out fine. Good. Any comments or questions? Councilor Rell? Just one comment. Thank you, Derek. Uh, I think it may have been me two year, or a year ago who suggested that. Um, simply, I mean, looking at public safety, I'm glad that, you know, didn't, doing it in parking lots doesn't, you know, um, increase risk for, you know, those who are either driving or walking through parking lots. Um, you don't have to give it to me now, and you know if you can't factor it in, um, no big deal. But uh, is would you envision a cost savings by doing it every other year for parking lots and not, you know having to to spend the money on um, staff time, materials? Uh, Are you referring to doing just doing our, all our lots every other year and not the off years? Uh, doing all, yeah, doing all the lots and. Um, you know, I don't know if there's a cost savings. I mean, we, we could do it that way. I, the way we're doing it, it keeps the budget kind of consistent. I mm -hmm. think where I'm at right now, we'll see how this year goes. But last year, we covered it. I expect this year we'll cover it. So then our budget could be the same every year. Otherwise, I'm going to have a higher budget one year, year and then lower yeah. the next. So we're bouncing around. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's preference. As far as staff time, 
Um, usually when we're doing uh, parking lots, it's, uh, it's off hours. We try and do it on the weekend, so they're overtime. You know, whether it's one year or the next, it would be the same thing with the overtime. Right. I need more. So maybe overtime. every off year doing yeah. it. Yeah, so we've been, we just try, let's yep. try to do half and half and just do it every year, but just do the half the lots each mm -hmm. year. So that seems, I'm okay with proceeding that way for now, just to right. keep everything kind of stable as far as our mm -hmm. finances go. And fiscally, we, you know, may save a couple bucks by doing it like that rather than. Yeah, we, I think we, you know, we had looked at it. We had reduced, uh, I think we saved 7,000 or so last year by not doing some of the lots. You know, the one thing with that is the high school that was, uh, as I mentioned, they used an epoxy resin pavement, which is more of a plastic pavement marking. That's not our town standard, but that does, it's more expensive, but it lasts longer. So since that was recently done, that's something we have not had to do. When we do, and there will come a time probably in the next two or three years, we're going to have to repaint those. That's going to be about a $4,000 expense just okay. to do the high school. So that's something we're, we're leaving out of last year's budget, this year's budget, because we evaluated and felt, you know, there wasn't any need to spend the money at this point. But that is something just to keep in mind. We'll, we'll come back. Mm -hmm. at some point as something we work into our rotation but with the savings of seven thousand approximately every year for four years until we need to do that i mean we could save nearly thirty thousand dollars and then you know spend only four no it's a good idea thank you okay. anybody else okay seeing none all in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed any abstentions motion carries thank you thank you uh, we have no ordinances or resolutions for introduction. We have the minutes of the May 14th, 2019 special meeting. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the meeting minutes May 14th, 2019 special meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Are there any changes, corrections, or deletions? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next, we have the meeting minutes of May 20th. Do I have a motion? Yes, Mayor. I approve a uh, motion to approve meeting minutes of May 20th, 2019, regular meeting. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Are there any changes to these meeting minutes? Nothing. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Abstain. Oh. I don't know. Was I there? I don't know, but if don't we, if you two abstain, we only have one, two, three, four votes. Can they approve minutes if they did not attend the meeting? We need one of, I'm you. Need one of you to, attend, to approve have, the meeting minutes. I don't minutes. have the minutes in front of me on my docket or document. So I read them, and I have no problem. So if you need an I vote and it's acceptable, I yeah. change my abstention to an I. Okay, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? <clears throat> Motion carries. Thank you. I appreciate that, Councilor Rell and Deputy Mayor um, Martino. We don't usually get to a place where we need everybody to vote in order for it to pass. <laughs> um, next, we're going to move back into public comment. Members of the public have five minutes to speak. Mr. Colantonio, you are ready to speak. Good evening again, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. I ran out of time before, but anyway, uh, I just want you guys to know that uh, uh, the curbing on the first residential driveway on the north side of Morrison Avenue needs to be replaced. Uh, I guess, you know, they're, they're all, you know, now. Uh, I was an engineer by training, so I, I, I pay attention to things. Since, since the reconstruction of the sidewalks, uh, every year the town has to to fix the, the curbing on Morrison Avenue. And nobody asks us you know, the questions why. Uh, Nut Street from uh, Ridge Road to the Burren Turnpike uh, was done probably about 20 years ago. And uh, not too long ago, I went by just for curiosity. And I said, wow, you know, it doesn't look at any place where the curbing has been replaced. And when I say that Morrison Avenue was an abortion, it shows every year. You have to replace the curbing. Why? Because nothing lines up. And when and when there is a big a big rainstorm that the, the water runs over between the sidewalk and the curbing, because underneath there is still a little bit of pavement. Well, when there is pavement underneath, six inches just behind the curbing, and you have a lot of water, 
you have a lot of erosion. Why was it done that way? We had inspector. Why? So, but anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Colantonio. Anybody else like to speak this evening? Mr. Young? Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. <clears throat> I'd like to go back to that um, disaster hazard mitigation discussion you had earlier. My understanding is it was started in 2014. So you folks were very much aware of it. And as Mr. Hurley had said, um, why are we putting up a salt shed in, in, in a questionable area? And why are we putting it in on a hazard plan as a number one issue when you knew you were going to do something with the salt shed you knew it you knew these people were working on this project that never should have even come up as number one it should not even come up maybe you don't talk to each other but bring it in here as a number one and uh, uh, item and, and it's you guys knew all along, and you should have told the people who were doing the work that you were going to put a salt shed in there, and that's going to be a permanent place forever and ever. I don't get it, folks. Um, we, I, I attended the Board of Education meeting last night, where they were t last week, where they were talking about the various cuts, and then tonight I heard that uh, on the state budget they're going to get some more money. Um, I hope that money goes into a uh, savings pot somewhere after they made their cuts and not rescind on their cuts. But uh, the way that this whole budget, with the lack of transparency, um, I think they're loaded with money now. They were loaded with money before, and now they're even loaded with more. And uh, the, the way that shifting of the monies went it, it tells something's wrong with that budget and how that all worked out. Maybe I missed something. Seven hundred seven million here and only a one and a half million over here as a reduction. There's, there's a whole hunk of money missing, or, or nobody's talking about it, or somebody should maybe send me a message where the difference was. That would be helpful. You know, we talked about the budget tonight, the state budget. We could talk about the state budget from last year, too, and the dishonesty that went on up there with the Randy Etzel deal, the last minute slide in to the, to the, to the budget for conflicts of the state of Connecticut doesn't have conflicts of interest anymore, thanks to the guy who slipped it in. Uh, the agreement to bail out the city of Hartford, which hurt all of us, but that's another thing that they slipped in. And then now this year, uh, we have the family leave that's going to whack everybody that works. 0.5% of your salary will be going into a pool. Uh, that's, that's an added tax. We have new sales tax, expanded sales taxes. We have more expanded taxes on prepared foods. Um, we got debt-free college coming up. They say lottery is going to pay for that, but lottery was going to pay for education too, and it never did. And then, of course, we had, uh, if anybody read the John Lender article this weekend in the Hartford Current about the 3.5% for the next two years, uh, the people who, 420 people up at the state capitol who are partisan, body partisan, I don't know what kind of positions they actually have. There, many of them answer telephones. Uh, they do such a fantastic job, they were guaranteed a 3.5% rate increase for the next two years, which will dig more into our pockets and show just about how dishonest the state of Connecticut continues to be. And then, of course, we have the city of Hartford that uh, romps and raves now, that the city plans, plan, uh, cities plan funds new jobs, services, capital improvements, and no tax increase. We got a big tax increase this year, Mayor. 
these guys got nothing. And they got, they're hiring more people. I wonder how that happened. Nobody talked about that in this year when it was all coming down. And the dishonesty that we have up at the state capitol that bailed them out. We had that dishonest mayor that came here droning. Every, the, the, the consensus was nobody wanted to help him, but he already knew he had help and how the deal was going to already turn out and he was going to get bailed out. And the rest of us are bailing him out every year now. And this, this is just how dishonest the state of Connecticut, and, 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 and it just shows it. It filters right down to here, dishonesty. Thank you very much, Mayor. Good night. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, seeing no one, um, we will take a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. Thank you. Have a good night. Well, I'll be hard for that one. Call <laughs> 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 <laughs>